And we are recording. Okay, great. Um, Welcome everyone. If everyone could put their microphones on mute, just to start, I'm gonna do a little introduction. My name is Dana Pilla. I am going to moderate the webinar this evening. Um, On behalf of the Flunge board, I'd like to welcome you to Flunge's second web chat for educators for the 2018-19 school year. This evening's web chat is entitled, Writing the Ship, World Language Classroom Management, at the half year mark. My name is Dana Pilla. I will be facilitating this evening's web chat. Our web chat series is a new professional development offering to the world language community. Flunge's webinars are designed to bring important ideas um, to, I'm sorry, and conversations to our members through the experts on our board. Please note that the audio and video of this webinar will be recorded. I'll provide you with details about how you can access the on-demand recording at the end of the web chat. The webinar is scheduled to last one hour and will be run more like an informal discussion among the participants and facilitators. If you'd like to ask a question of the presenters during the webinar, feel free to use the audio feature, which you can mute and unmute as needed. Or if you're more comfortable with the web chat feature on the right, the written chat, you may use that as well to ask questions. The presenters will address your questions as you ask them. Take advantage of this opportunity to dialogue directly with experts in the field. As a registered live participant, you are eligible to receive a certificate of attendance stating that you signed up for and logged into this webinar. Details on how to receive this will be shared with you at the end of the webinar. Flunge cannot guarantee that you'll get credit for this um, from your district, but um, we will be giving you a certificate. For those watching the video on demand later, we do not give certificates of attendance for watching this on demand, only for watching it live. All participants are encouraged to work with their immediate supervisor to determine how best to receive credit for this professional development. In the event of technical difficulties, please remain connected to the webinar. As you are able, Flunge will contact you directly if the problem cannot be resolved. You may also email us at dpilla at flunge.org, but please understand that it's sometimes not possible to check the email and run the webinar simultaneously. Thank you for your time and attention to these messages. And now let me introduce you to our presenters, Doug Kraus and Christopher Gwynn. Uh, hi to you both. I'll, I'll uh, get started, and then uh, I'll ask Chris to to, uh, to join us and uh, just tell a little tell us a little bit about his work and his uh, experience as a world language educator. Uh, I teach uh, middle school French. Uh, this is my eleventh year, going into my eleventh year. I teach up in Sparta, in the northwest corner of the state, and I also teach the methods and uh, starting to teach theories this spring at Rutgers. So. Um, Language education is something that uh, I really believe in and that I, uh, it's become my, my passion and uh, it's, it's great to be able to share a little bit and learn from everyone on the call here tonight. Um, we are uh, going to really focus on what your particular concerns are uh, as, as educators, that what your challenges are, uh, what opportunities you see, and to try to help you get to that point that you want to. Uh, because we're a small group, that we just have two participants who have signed up, uh, Matt and Martha, you two, uh, mm-hmm. that will really focus on, you know, discussing uh, ways that we can go about resolving any issues you're having uh, or to, you know, capitalize on any opportunities you see in your own particular teaching experience. So with that, I will uh, ask Chris to uh, share a little bit about himself. I'm going to go on mute for a moment. Hi, it's Chris. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Chris. Thank you. Oh, good. I'm glad. Hi, Martha. Martha yes, hi. Hello. Welcome. Yes, hi. Um, How are you? I, I, am, I am doing well. Um, I am teaching for more than 11 years. <laughs> Doug said the number of years. So <laughs> <laughs> oh. me laugh. I, I'll tell the truth. I'm in year 30. This is my 30th year of teaching. Okay. Wow. It's Woo-hoo. out there. Um, I teach uh, part-time at a public high school near Camden in the south of New Jersey, and I teach part-time at the University of Pennsylvania in the west of Philadelphia, and I teach part-time for the iCademy Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. That's my uh, current teaching situation um, at this time, and I'm happy to be here and be a part of the conversation. So with that, uh, what we... um... Now, Dana, would you like to? Uh, yeah. do you no, want Doug, to just... you can do. You can you can direct the questioning. So I was just going to say to our participants that if they have anything specific, they're welcome to chime in when they want. 
otherwise you and Chris will kind of bring up some topics and maybe have a discussion between the two, two of you about things that you think um, can help our participants get through this mid-year lull. It sounds good. Let, let's start by, um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Martha, would you just tell us a little bit about your t teaching situation and you know, share with us what it is that you know, brought you here tonight to, to take part in this web chat? All right. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Um, I um, right now I'm teaching uh, middle school at Cinnamon Sin, uh, in South Jersey. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, the reason I'm here is because I started teaching in basically middle middle of November, and it's been very difficult because I have especially one group that is is a big class, and um, uh, I have what should I say, like a discipline problem. They're very, very extremely chatty. I have a mix of students that, you know, some are interested, some just sometimes they feel, I feel like they don't, don't, they don't want to be there. So my idea was trying to engage them and, you know, doing fun activities, uh, try to play some Jeopardy, some Quizlet, some stuff, but still they don't seem like they, they're not motivated. They're not enjoying it. They're not like they just basically look at me and kind of like I feel like they're close and uh, I don't know how to, you know, um, get excited about learning Spanish. So that's probably my big and the fact that I started late. It seemed like uh, when I started um, the previous teacher was or the teachers were not, I don't know, try to focus them into learning. So um, it's been a big of a challenge so far. <laughs> that sounds very challenging, Martha. Um, can, you, yes. can you share with us a little bit more about what their previous experience, so first, what grade level is this? It's uh, seventh, seventh grade. All right. I, I find, um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I find that seventh grade is the most difficult year, even in the wow. best of circumstances. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what it is in particular about seventh graders, but uh, I, I yeah. find that they present the biggest challenges. Um, can you, so you, can you tell us a little bit more about what you know about what their, their previous learning experience was? Uh, in well, um, they started they started at sixth grade uh, with uh, exploratory Spanish and also French. So at seventh grade, they have to pick, you know, whatever language they want to continue. And basically, they have to stick with it. Um, so I guess last year, you know, some of them uh, just well decided to continue with the Spanish. But when they started, when they started uh, this year, they didn't have a, a Spanish teacher. So they started with subs, basically. Uh, they had a long term sub uh, for like about a month and then some other subs. Um, so, you know, they I don't know. I believe that I feel that they were not uh, completely, in, you know, uh, guided focus than when they were supposed to learn. Um, it's I I guess it's because it's a bigger class. I have 27 students. Um, I have other classes of seventh graders and they're not as big. So I have one that is 16 and the other one is 20. And I don't have that problem with them. Honestly, they are. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but you know they. Their grades are excellent. Uh, they are engaged. They participate. That uh, I try to keep them motivated, and it is working. But not with this particular class. So um, you know, and yeah, I mean, that's basically what I know about them. And ha and how big oh, did you say the class is, Martha? Twenty-seven students. Twenty-seven. Okay. Yeah. This is Chris. I was going to say, Martha, could you tell us just a little tiny bit about your own background? What what was okay. your professional experience before you were teaching this middle school it's, course? All right. I used to work uh, for a Catholic school. I worked there for uh, 10 years in Philadelphia. And I used to teach kindergarten all the way through uh, eight. And, well, I, I can say for a fact that, you know, Catholic education is way different than because uh, I'm in a public school right now. So it's, it's, it's been different. It's, 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 it's different. Um, you know, discipline wise, uh, um, um, uh, let's see the background, kids' backgrounds, families, uh, you know, stuff. I mean, I, I, I one funny experience is uh, that I, uh, you know, the, when I was in Catholic school, I used to start with a prayer, right? 
So it was very difficult for me to change that, uh, you know, uh, costume, you know, just basically start with the Pledge of Allegiance and that's it, just teach your class and, and no problem. So um, I'm a psychologist and um, right now I'm uh, following the alternate route. And um, that's, you know, that's why, you know, I applied for this job, I got it and I'm supposed to finish uh, to get my standard certificate to, you know, be able to teach Spanish. I also have a, a, a CE certificate of eligibility and uh, psychology and K through six. Thank you so much Thank for, you. for sharing all that, Martha. Mm -hmm. um, that gives us a little bit, uh, I mean, that gives us a good sense then of, of uh, mm -hmm. I think as, as with your psychology background, that is a great mm -hmm. asset um, and you probably mm -hmm. understand children and why they behave the way they do in ways that yeah. perhaps other teachers don't. So you could probably <laughs> share some things with us that you're observing and kind of relate that back to research and yeah. what we know about mm -hmm. behavior. Uh, as I said, I think seventh graders are a very a fascinating area of study. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. psychologists. <laughs> So, yes. uh, and we'll, we'll talk in, in a moment about maybe some things that you can try and some strategies. Uh, Chris, did you, you want to say anything now or do, do we want to ask Matt to talk a little bit about his situation, his teaching situation? I think let's, let's hear from Matt and then we have the big picture and then we can go forward from there. Great. Matt, you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, everyone. Hi, Matt. And Hi, I, Matt. Sh I should say that Matt is part Hi, of our, uh, our mentoring program. We have a mentoring fellowship at uh, Flange and Matt is part of that mentoring fellowship. So we're, it's great to... Uh, that you signed up, we appreciate it, and uh, look forward to hearing about, uh, you know, how how we can help one another tonight. So I don't know if I'm really well. Of course, working with kids, you're guaranteed to struggle. Um, but I yeah. think I was I I signed up for this more because I'm getting a little. Um, I feel like my lessons are getting a little stale, or my normal tricks are wearing away, and so just me, I. Uh, I'm trying, I'm most curious about any tips of how to like spice things up in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So I am a third year Spanish teacher, um, also alternate route. Um, I completed the program last year and I have taught in three districts in the last three years, um, all the way from seventh grade up to 11th grade uh, for Spanish. And so I'm currently teaching in Rumson Fairhaven Regional High School. Um, I teach Spanish levels one, two, and three. So my day is very unique that I've got some very motivated freshmen and some un, you know, not so motivated freshmen. Um, uh, it's uh, interesting. I feel like I teach the entire football team, which ironically, they are my best students and they are my most challenging students. So um, towards the end of the day, I have two Spanish one levels, which are tricky because the, they're at the end of the day, of course. and um, the one group just never stops talking and the other group is like i had said i have a lot of football players so there's it's a class of 19 uh 14 of them boys and seven of those boys are on the football team and i want to say at least three or four other guys do different sports at the school so it's a different it's a unique dynamic at the end of the day when you're trying to get them through something that they kind of already know from middle school so teaching level one, you have to start from level zero, but a lot of these kids just didn't test into level two when they came into the high school. So it's um, kind of tricky trying to balance, you know, the levels of proficiency as well as the levels of attention. So that's kind of my situation in a nutshell. It's, it's Chris here, Matt, could I ask you, you said at the beginning, I thought I heard you say, some of the students are motivated and some of the students are not. Have you thought about what the root of the motivation is and, and non-motivation is? Do you have uh, thoughts about that? So basically when I'm, what I meant by that is I have, um, I, have um, I guess I teach about maybe 50% freshmen, 35% sophomores, and 15% juniors. And it kind of depends because in level two, you have, you know, the advanced freshmen and the average sophomores and in Spanish three, you could have advanced sophomores and average juniors per se on the language level. Um, and so just there's a mix. So like I find it that my younger students in the class are often 
very strong because they're just naturally uh, more motivated as students. Whereas the kids that I feel that are, you know, level one as freshmen, level two as sophomore, and level three as juniors, they're kind of there because they feel that they have to be in order to get to college. Um, uh, Rumson Fairhaven is a pretty intense high school, so I think that the expectation is that they will continue to take a language, even though it might not be an interest of theirs. So that's really where I think it kind of diverts that, you know, you've got the kids who are taking it more because they're either good at it or they like it um, versus the ones that are doing it more as a chore. Um, and I'm, uh, I forgot to mention, I'm a TCNJ graduate. I majored in international studies in Spanish, but um, after teaching in Austria for a few, for two years, I came back to New Jersey and did alternate route to become a teacher here. So that's kind of my, my spiel. I, I'm wondering, um, uh, Martha and Matt, how, uh, kind of going to what Chris was asking, how, how do you ascertain, you know, what the attitudes are, what the motivation levels are, um, and, you know, kind of how do you drill down to that? Do, do you survey students? Do you have individual conversations with students? Uh, you know, whether those surveys are by name or anonymous, how do you get kind of a, how do you keep your finger on the pulse of, of your classes? Uh, Matt, if you want me to start, um, uh, I did it. I did it with this class, and uh, uh, I basically, you know, I had to basically stop the stop the class, and I asked them, like, you know, because the, the class is very chatty, and I said, what what can what can we do to make this class better? So the students and I started writing stuff on the board uh, about you know, what can we do or what can I do? What can they do to make it better? Um, you know, the majority agree that, you know, the discipline should be better, uh, that um, I should, you know, use another strategies, you know, different things to motivate them, not only like worksheets and stuff, you know, like do use Quizlet or I start even actually doing Duolingo and they enjoyed it. Um, but still, like, you know, the same amount of students are the ones that keep talking. And uh, one thing I noticed is that, of course, if they don't understand, if they don't get it, well, they're going to get easily distracted and not pay attention at all. Um, so, you know, here we go again. Like, you know, what should I do? Like, uh, try to work one on one, try to call them for answers and uh, try to uh, or even talk to them like, you know, uh, I would try to talk to them like what's going on, what you like Spanish. Some some of them actually said that they uh, took Spanish because French was already, the course was already uh, full. So I'm like, I feel bad because, you know, a student, if, they, if the student wants to take French, not Spanish, what should be in Spanish in the first place? Um, what other things, some other, I have other students with IEPs or 504s that, um, that if, you know, if, they, for example, if they're not medicated, uh, there, there's no way I'm going to get them uh, on track. And if they're going to, you know, distract the entire class because they're not going to understand, they're going to keep talking. Um, you know, I found stuff like that. Um, uh, I even tried to use um, like a, a reward system where if the students do certain things, uh, like participating, uh, getting like a in quiz, like a 90, uh, 90 and uh, between 90 and 94 or 95 and 100, they get certain points. So once they, once they reach 10 points, they get some perks like, you know, uh, phone call home or like extra points for quizzes and tests. So some of them are extremely motivated by that, but others, you know, you can say that maybe, but they're not. They're okay if they don't get anything. So yeah, it's, I tried all that, and still sometimes eh, I feel like a little bit of change in the class, but still, like I need other, you know, other ideas. So Martha, it's Chris. I think I'm going to jump in if it's okay. Sure. Doug introduced an idea here, um, and just just an idea to consider, maybe for you as uh -huh. the instructor to reframe the scaffold, the thinking around the approach here, and maybe not okay. use the term discipline, but think okay. of this as a community. What if we okay. 
thought about how to approach the students, include the students, manage the students in terms of building a community in the classroom rather than the discipline of the children. And okay. by that difference, I mean, I think that what's happening in all classrooms um, is that the children respond to stimuli. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. rather than they have a set of behavior patterns and they bring them with them, I, I think of it as there are environmental factors in the room, there are social factors in the room, and those yeah. contribute to responses from the children. And my responsibility as the adult, the instructor, the leader, is to try to frame or construct a space where we build a community of learners. And so we could make some decisions about what's appropriate and not appropriate in our community, and how do we respond when someone does something that we have decided isn't appropriate for our community. Does that make sense the way I'm yes. saying that? Yes, totally, totally. I, um, yeah, um, I mean, I don't know. Teenagers at that age are, they respond to um, what others think about them. And I think that's probably a major uh, factor, you know, as to, you know, when they, if they, if they, I mean, if they understand the Spanish, Spanish, and they uh, uh, participate, they're gonna feel good with themselves, and they, you know, receive the, uh, uh, I don't know, admiration or uh, receive the, uh, they feel like they're cool, they're, you know, good. Uh, uh, or when the student um, doesn't get it, sometimes I've noticed that they try to, um, to use the cool card. You, I don't know if, um, you know. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say, but they just, they don't get it, but they just come up with a joke or something to make everybody laugh and, you know, to, you know, to, to, to show that, um, you know, they don't get it, but they're still cool. Like, you know, they, well, I, I would offer there, I would offer two things to that comment. One, I'm teaching in an undergraduate program and, the, and those types of young people's behaviors are the same wanting to fit in, wanting to be cool, wanting yeah. to be accepted. I see that as not different at all from seventh graders. I would also say that there's a lot of research now, we can, we can point to this research later, um, mm -hmm. that shows that those kinds of behaviors are also responses to the environment and the social situation in order to gain acceptance. It's just mm -hmm. a different framing exactly. of it. So, so I think of community as everybody's responding to the stimuli, some people are coming to class with their homework prepared brilliantly, with their hand up, ready to participate, trying to do everything in Spanish. And then somebody else is trying to make a joke and get some laughs and get some attention. The, the goals are the same. It's just mm -hmm. that they're taking different paths to the, to the end goal. Chris, can I can jump in there for a sec? Please do, yeah. Um, so Chris and I agree 100% on this idea of cultivating community in the classroom um, as, as – you know, a, as the alternative to kind of the the older fashion, you know, cracking the whip and um, making everything about imposition of, of of rules. You know, getting kids involved in in the creation of the rules, getting them to understand the rationale for their existence and their use, that kind of thing. Um, I had a in terms of the students who are trying to get laughs. Uh, that is a common thing in all of our classes, and it's understandable. And I had a situation a couple of years ago where I had a boy who really craved that kind of attention, was trying to get laughs. And he was, I, I teach all the time and Chris does too in, uh, in the language, in the target language. So I'm in French all the time. Chris is in German all the time. And our expectation is the students are either quiet and they're, they're absorbing, they're processing the, the comprehensible input that we provide for them, or they're participating in a meaningful, positive way, which would be using the target language. So uh, I, I said to this boy who was calling out in English uh, with, with jokes, um, you know, the, the challenge for you, and this is me talking to this, this seventh grader, the challenge for you is to be funny in French. And I know that you're very funny in English, but I want you to set that as a challenge for yourself, to step it up and, you know, you already know that you can do this in English. I want to see if you can do it in French. And he, he took on that challenge. And by even, you know, the end of seventh grade, but definitely by the eighth grade, he was such a, a contributor to our classroom community, to our climate in the classroom. 
uh, because he was he was interacting in appropriate ways, but he was funny. You know, he was funny in French, and he and I really, you know, we laughed about that at the end of eighth grade. That how far he had come and how he had really taken on that challenge and and, and excelled at it. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is something that I talked to my students at the beginning of their experience with French. Um, it, so this is the beginning of seventh grade. I, I asked them, what's the difference between, because Martha, you, you mentioned that some of your students in, in Spanish class uh, had initially uh, wanted to take uh, French, but weren't yes. able to get in. So there's a motiv <laughs> there's a motivation problem there. It, you know, and yeah. it, they, they could say to you every day, well, I, sh I don't even want to be here anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so w what I say to my students is, you know, there's a big difference between saying um, in the case of Spanish, uh, you know, I take I take Spanish and I'm a I'm a Spanish speaker. And and I want them to kind of let that roll around in their heads a little bit and for them to feel the power of one versus the other saying, you know, I'm a Spanish speaker. I may be a novice speaker, but I am a Spanish speaker. And if they if they accept that, if they really embrace that as part of their identity, because that's a, the power of what we do is to really set them off on a new trajectory in their lives, that they start to envision themselves as something, something new, that this is part of their identity. I'm a Spanish speaker. Then, you know, that can really have a, a, a real effect with in, in the mind of a young person and in their conduct in class. So it, it may be I'm something. I'm sorry, Doug. Can I yeah. interrupt for a second? Yeah. I yes. wanted to ask, just to finish that thought for you and Chris, I just have a follow-up question that perhaps can help both Martha and Matt with their perspective questions are a little bit different. But I understand Matt's problem as well with feeling like things are stagnant in the middle of the year because it's just happened to me a lot. So my question for both you and Chris as you know, people that have taught multiple levels and multiple years of teaching mm -hmm. is what, um, what place does a tight lesson running routine um, the implementation of varied models of cooperative learning and group work and the integration of real life activities where they're using the language, um, the integration of all of these together help with behavior management and also um, keeping the students attuned to what's going on in class and not getting off task. You know, because there's behavior management techniques, but there's other things I know you and Chris do to keep the students engaged and have more to do with curriculum. So Chris, why don't you take it? Um, uh, Dana mentioned three really critical things in, in addressing and in, in just making sure that we have that classroom culture. One is keeping lessons tight. So, you know, keeping transition smooth, moving from one thing to another, keeping things varied, cooperative learning. So getting students to really tackle, in some cases, you know, problems, if we want to do sort of problem-based learning. But any anything, any task that we bring to them that they can work that out together, we know how powerful that can be. And then the third thing is bringing authentic tasks into the classroom. Um, you want to talk about any of those or all of those? Sure, sure, yeah. And I'll tie it right on to what, we, what you were saying to Martha. I think that that's a great question for both Martha and Matt. Thank you, Dana. Um, as far as uh, I'll use an example from today at the public high school where I'm teaching. They decided uh, somebody in his infinite wisdom to test all the fire alarms during the classes. An announcement came along <laughs> as, we're, as we're having class that said, please disregard the fire alarm. And then it began to ring for 20 minutes uninterrupted. <laughs> wow. So disregarding it became difficult after about 30 seconds for me. I have no idea how long it was. For the children but i leaned into it with with what i think is my own sense of humor i think i have a sense of humor um i keep meeting people who tell me i don't but i think i do and i just decided to try to make a little bit light out of it um in that moment rather than letting it um, take us off track from the lesson so i sort of continued what i was saying to the students in between the noises of the fire alarm trying to keep a tight lesson my first response uh, so to the comments that Doug was making and to connect to Martha's question and lead into Matt's question, um, in, in my high school classes, we're, um, students are completing their own portfolios of their own progress, and we're, we're using that with the metaphor of a journey. 
So we're, we're stopping at certain points along the way and we're asking the question, where are we on the journey? And I have said since the beginning, learning language is a lifelong journey. I'm still on it. I learn something new every single day. And you're going to choose how long you'll be on this journey. Some of you will be here for six weeks, some for a year, some for four years, some for a lifetime. So where do you see your end destination? Where would you like the ship to land? And where are you now? And so rather than doing sort of a proficiency update or something, we're doing little stops along the way to talk about our own progress. And when we do that, I'm trying to build in incrementally opportunities for students to do some creation of the curriculum as well. So that if they're feeling that the way that I'm presenting or my style of teaching or the way that we're managing the class is not working for their personal learning style, then they're getting incrementally more opportunities to self-create, to work independently so that we can um, meet their needs. And I think that speaks to this sort of midwinter lull that you know we've kind of gotten into a routine. How can we break out of it? That's one way. Um, cooperative learning plays a tremendous role. I, I'm Vygotskian in my training for language teaching. I believe very strongly that students learn language best in community rather than in isolation. So I would say 98% of what we do in the classroom has a cooperative learning piece to it. And the management issues there about, you know, the stronger partner, the less interested, the less motivated partner, how to manage that is an opportunity for me. I tried many different methods. Again, individualization comes up here. And then under authentic tasks, for me, that comes in as early as possible. We connect our students to real interlocutors of their own age, their own peers, as early as novice mid, I would say, um, so that they're engaged with people who speak this language as a first language from their earliest experiences, and they build on that. Um, the school where I'm teaching has an exchange program, so they can get to that. I would say um, that I was not trying to be esoteric. I was trying to be very practical when I talked about the classroom as a community. And I think that tight lesson being very um, connected to cooperative learning activities that are varied and meaningful for as many students as possible and keeping them connected to real speakers in the target culture is important. But I would also say there's always going to be a student I cannot reach. I, I don't know that we can reach every single student every single day. I, I don't know if that's possible. Um, good, good points, Chris. Um, and that is true. There, I, I've had lots of students that I can think of, uh, you know, more obviously earlier in my career, but even, you know, even now, uh, try as we might, sometimes it just doesn't happen. Um, Chris mentioned portfolios, you know, and, and Matt, you're looking for things, ways to sort of spice things up. Uh, one thing that I found this year that's been a great change, a really positive change that I've gotten good feedback on is each week for 10 minutes or so, um, I, I, the students have created their own, uh, well, they've got goal partners. So it's groups of three, three students who meet each Friday for 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. And they, they are setting goals, uh, within the context of the class. So cultural and language goals, and they are, so for the next week, and then they're discussing the goals that they've met from the previous week. So Martha, as I, as I hear you describe your challenges, it seems to me that um, one thing you could offer to students, and Matt, you might want to try this too, is, is this idea of identifying what, it, what is it within this, this realm, this very big world of, you know, this Spanish-speaking world, where, where do you see yourself? You know, where kinds of things are interesting? Do you want to learn how to do a new dance? Are, there, are you interested in music and you want to explore new artists and, and Spanish-speaking artists? There are tons of them. Uh, yeah. Is your interest more food? Uh, are there recipes you want to try, foods you want to try? Do you want to spend a little time identifying restaurants in, you know, South Jersey that 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 you could go to and try these foods? You know, those kinds of goals that are meaningful to them. My, my kids mm -hmm. really look forward to that time. And it's been amazing. So then they've put the goals up on the on the wall of the classroom as they've reached them and they've shared them with them. And it is just wonderful to see how excited they get. Uh, talking about them and then um, you know sharing them and so that their classmates see what they are doing uh, it's 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 great stuff and I feel like you know if that's something you want to try to really kind of energize your kids 
Uh, it could be mm -hmm. one one thing. Um, and a portfolio, you know, it doesn't even have to be a fancy thing. These these goals go into their portfolio. I just do, use Google Docs, and that's something I'd be happy to share with you what one of those looks like. Um, Thank you. If if you two would be uh, interested in that, and definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's uh, and we'll you will be following up with you. It sounds like you know you're closer to Chris's neighborhood, uh, uh, Martha, than um, than to mine way up here in North Jersey. Yeah. Uh, and I'm a little bit closer to Matt, although not very, <laughs> not very close to Matt <laughs> Rumson. Well, but Matt and I stay in touch through other channels. But um, we we really do want to stay in touch with you and and uh, offer you whatever resources you think might be helpful. Um, Having a pen pal can also be a powerful motivator. Yes. Uh, once a student, uh, you know, makes that connection. Uh, my students in eighth grade were just writing to their pen pals in France today. We're awaiting our letters from Senegal. And, and that is, boy, they just, uh, you know, I don't have to tell them what to do. They read those letters and they, they just jump right in and they, they get excited. So that can take some time. You know, you, you're looking for some immediate things you can do. And, and of course, setting up a pen pal exchange takes takes some time. Um, but that that is one thing, you know, in the bigger picture and longer term, you can you can be thinking about. Uh, that, that's, can I um, yeah. go? I'm sorry. I was just going to ask Matt a question about sort of mid year spicing it up. What um, what have you tried thus far? Um. Well, just to give you a little bit more insight into the situation, so two, Spanish 2 and Spanish 3 are two brand new curricula, so we literally have nothing, so we're pretty much making everything from scratch without a textbook, which I do believe is the best way that language should be taught, because it forces you to use authentic materials and such. Mm -hmm. um, but what are we doing? So um, a lot of it is like, uh, trying to get them to move around the room, talking with partners. Um, we've done a digital breakout, although that takes a tremendous amount of time to set up. Um, we have done, and those activities are the ones that they respond to very, very well. Um, it's sometimes the challenge is finding the time. Um, I tried an activity today, it's called Gim Kit. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Um, it's kind of like Quizlet on steroids. It's um, you take a Quizlet or you can combine different Quizlets. And basically the students have to get answers correct to then earn points, which is actually in the form of cash. And then they can use that cash to buy ways to sort of compound their point earnings. So it can go on for quite a while and it stays high, high risk because everyone's competing for, you know, to get it all, to get the most. So, um, and what's know, the language skill involved? Well, that's usually review. That's usually like the review games. Um, another activity we've done is called Cori and Circulo, which means running in circles. Um, and basically, there's papers all around the wall, all around the walls that are taped up. And uh, so, usually, you do this with questions. So, you can put a question at the bottom of the page, and then at the top of the page on a different sheet of paper there is a uh, an answer and so their job is to find the correct answer and then below that answer is the clue that they have to then find the next answer on the next piece of paper and they're scattered all over the room so they work with partners to try and find the answer so that's another way that they're um it can be a review it can be um some sort of comprehension check it's um it can sort of be adapted to however you want it to be Matt, is how comfortable are you um, Matt, with chaos during the class lesson? Um, it's not my favorite thing, but I definitely <laughs> can appreciate good chaos. I'm asking you that question because I'm thinking of there's, there's an old fashioned paradigm where um, an administrator feels that a class is running well because the students are quiet and the teacher's talking. And then there's a new paradigm where there's all kinds of noise and activity happening because it's a hybrid learning situation but every day is focused on the opportunity to make progress toward proficiency and i'm just thinking about that and my second thought is um changing it up making it more challenging more interesting um getting the attention of the students is a question of how much time and effort you want to put into setting all these things up if you're really feeling that you want to make the classroom environment different because we've hit a mid-year lull 
it, it becomes the question of how much effort, how much time can you make outside of the classes to create all these materials for, for this kind of engagement. And I was gonna mention two ideas here. Um, I had a class I struggled with a number of years ago, and my struggle in the class was I couldn't get them to use the language. When it came time to ask a question, I got silence from the group. It just was one particular class, and they were very hesitant to use the language, and that was my challenge. And so what I did to address that, I took them out of the space. I took them to a different space. I arranged for us in this particular case to go to the school theater, the auditorium, and use that space. It was available during that time. I arranged for it, we went there, and I conducted class in a different space in a different way. And I was very surprised that that was enough of a catalyst to change the behavior. So I'm thinking midway through the year, I'm teaching these high school courses. One of them, I'm going to move rooms after their midterm exam. The room we're in does not work for us. The way it's set up, it's just not working. And so I found another room that was available made the arrangements and we're gonna make that switch. And I believe, I'll find out in a couple of weeks, but I believe that that physical change of environment is going to have an impact on how they're perceiving what we're doing in the class. And so I'm wondering in your case, with the one class that's particularly challenging, what if you were able to change the physical space for a short period of time, maybe one lesson or such, and see what kind of an impact that has on how they are responding to what you're doing? It's not a bad idea. Hey, Matt, Matt, is this uh, the site that you use that I've got up on the screen? Can you see it? Uh, toolkit or GIM kit? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Okay. Just want to make sure. Um, um, Doug and Chris, can I ask another follow-up question? Um, can either of you talk to um, Matt and Martha about grouping strategies, um, different ways to have students do cooperative activities, like I'm thinking jigsaw, um, four corners, just ways to kind of move the kids around and make collaboration a little more lively and different as we are here in the mid-year. Because I resonated with what Matt said earlier that everything sometimes starts to feel stale because you're doing the same type of activities all the time. And at times just changing one or two cooperative learning activities during the period makes a huge difference um, in motivation and also behavior. Um, sure. Would you like me to go first, Doug? Would you like to go first? Chris, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I, I would say I use a lot of physical things to manipulate. So rather, I'm, I'm a person who would use um, the one-to-one -one book less often. I happen to be teaching a school where the internet connectivity is a challenge on a daily basis. And so we kind of are using what might be called more old-fashioned tools. But I find physically something that they are doing as an activity that they have to manipulate themselves as part of a larger activity. So if it's four corners or jigsaw, whatever those things are, those are great, but that they're actually moving something around um, and have different responsibilities each time we do an activity. So if we're doing um, constructing sort of in a presentational speaking situation, constructing how we want to respond to a set of prompts. And so what I've done is put all over the room the different categories that they can use and their job as teams of students who divide up into teams is to put those ideas together into a coherent thought that could um, create a follow-up question and so each time i do something like that the roles change so if you had the role the first time in your group to collect the materials for your group the next time you have the role to be the person to record the response the next time you have the role to make sure we're on task whatever the roles are we rotate them. We also divide ourselves into teams, different teams all the time, using whatever the content is in the moment. So it could be a vocabulary review, it could be a structural review, but it's um, elements from the current theme so that we're reinforcing their understanding of that and they use that. So for example, if you've just talked a little bit about um, uh, where we want to eat, so there's some review about how to express that in the book, right? they find their partners using that in a matching sense. I also keep in mind while I'm doing that, who are the students who need more support and the students who need less support, and I manipulate a little bit to make sure that the groups are balanced so that the students who really struggle wouldn't be left on their own. So sometimes there's a little bit of teacher manipulation sort of behind the scenes. Also, when we regroup in where we sit, students sit in clusters of four. 
we're always changing that up, who's in our cluster, and I manipulate that as well to make sure that a student who really struggles, I happen to have a student um, who can't hear in the class, and so I just make sure that, that he gets to sit where he has better proximity, he needs that, so there's a little bit of manipulation, but a constant change up of with whom I'm working, a constant change of the activity and the framing of it. But I would say quickly, I'm sorry I'm talking so long, but I would say quickly, there's also a couple of routines that never change. When I'm always entering the class after the students because I have to come from somewhere else, and the, there's a clear expectation every day that you're in a seat and your notebook is open with a pen in your hand, or if it's a Chromebook or whatever it works in your class, but that's an expectation that's not going to change, that you're present, materials are out, and you're ready to go. And um, even if we're in a lull, I, I don't think that that expectation <laughs> should change. Okay. Yeah, there's, Sorry to be so long winded. You know, there's some things we haven't talked about that are kind of core to, you know, keeping a class running smoothly. One is, uh, you know, Dana brought up having a tight lesson that's critical, having really smooth transitions, making sure you over plan. Uh, making sure that uh, you always have those sponge activities for the end of class ready to go. I call them back pocket activities. Um, they're just something that I have to always have ready to go if there's just a few minutes. Uh, it, it's so critical that students feel when they're in our classes that every single minute counts, that we treat it seriously, that we treat our time together seriously, and that they would never, and I would never as their instructor, dream of, of wasting any of that precious, precious time. So, uh, yeah, when they come into class, they need to be doing things, something immediately. Uh, they need to know that they're accountable. Um, all of those things are, are, have to be part of the mix. In terms of, of grouping, um, I do do jigsaw activities. Um, I, I do some, uh, some, some larger group activities. Because most of my students are um, novice learners, I, uh, I do do um, uh, a lot of pair work. So. Uh, for example, I, I, I use these, um, can you see my screen, uh, Matt and Martha? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I can. So these are, these are something I, I make up for each unit I do. Uh, not, that's not true, not for every unit, but for most of my bigger units, I make up partner sheets so that immediately I can say, you know, you're going to this particular place or, or it's this particular time or it's this particular country and they find their partners. So they, they want to make sure that their partner sheets are easily accessible um, so that, uh, you know, you don't ever want to have a situation, I'm sure you both appreciate this um, and know this, uh, where, where there's scrambling to who do, I, who do I partner with, who do I partner with. So making up these sheets in advance, this is for the unit I do on Quebec, where we have all these different places, the Ice Hotel, Ski Chalet, the Sugar Shack, um, and then for um, eighth grade, different countries that are French speaking in the world, making up these sheets, uh, making sure they have partners ready to go, again, in the interest of smooth transitions. And um, if someone's not in, then it, you can quickly partner them with someone uh, who's looking for, uh, who may be in a similar situation. Uh, but I, I have uh, uh, good, good uh, experiences with these kinds of partner sheets. So I'm not sure if you use any of those or if that might be of interest, but again, this is something that I'd be happy to share with you uh, after if, if, if you'd like. Thank you. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention that uh, has, has worked real well, because uh, a lot of what we're talking about here is motivating students, getting them to see the big picture, getting, getting them to buy in. And one of the things that we know that does not work when we have these kinds of situations is lecturing students is to, to tell them what they did and why it was wrong and um, you know you better do better next time. What I do at the beginning of the year is I, I share with students this idea of a metaphor uh, of rowing, that we're literally in the same boat together, we're, we're rowing toward our, toward our goal across the Atlantic to reach France or however they want to envision that, but the idea that we're, we're rowing together, that um, when they pull harder on those those oars, they're making it easier for others in the boat. Um, you're headed in the same direction. You need to be pulling together. And so I just kind of make that rowing motion. If a student, if I, if my question is, are you really on task? Are you doing what you need to be doing as a member of this class? Are you part of our community at this particular moment? I'm going to just make that little rowing motion. And at first, you know, they kind of giggle, but, but by now in the year, uh, they take it pretty seriously, and it avoids having to give any lectures. I don't lecture students. Um, I simply point it out, and if they've violated a rule, 
I don't know if you two have rules in your in your classrooms, um, but I I put them on the tables every day. I can easily refer to them. And if a student if a student has violated a rule uh, that you know that we've all agreed on that are important, um, I'll just uh, I'll do that rolling motion. I'll point to the rule and just indicate that they have a warning. My second consequence um, would be they're stepping out of the activity. They need to leave the circle, the community. Um, for a given time, five or 10 minutes or longer, depending on the behavior. And the third thing is contacting the family. But I find that that is a good system uh, for me personally. So I would just share that with you if you think that might work. Because we want to, on the one hand, we want to provide the carrot. We want to get them motivated. We want that buy-in. We want to, you know, a strong community. But uh, we, we do have to um, make sure that we are imposing consequences if we are saying that there'll be consequences there need to be if there are, have been a violation of, of the rules of that community. So just just mention that. I would you. add to that that halfway through the year is a great time to revisit the classroom expectations. And if students have made real progress in the community, I might open that up to discussion about which of these expectations no longer apply or you're not cool with or you'd like to change or add something to at this point, kind of trying to use the language at the level that that's appropriate to bring them into a conversation about how we're forming this or how we're rowing together and where are we now sort of at this halfway point? Is it, is it a good time to revisit some of that and make some new choices? Absolutely. And you started by saying, Chris, that, you know, just talking with students about progress. And I think it another, you know, in terms of leverage uh, or big, uh, you know, big, big leveraging points is, reaching out, uh, sending a note home to, uh, you know, a parent when it's warranted, when a student has done something, uh, one of, especially those students who give us a hard time sometimes to reach out to, to, to mom or dad or grandparent, whoever they're with at home and saying, boy, what a great day today. And here's specifically things that, you know, that uh, Juan did in class that are, that I really wanted to bring to your attention. He should be so proud of himself. Um, you know, when we can do that in an honest way, when it's really warranted, boy, the effects can be amazing. I've seen it over and over again. So if you have students like that in your class who might be giving you a hard time, you know, you're looking for those those things that they do that really are worth um, pointing out to to the families. And you, you can see a big difference when, when you've done that. You, you've, you maybe have seen that in your own professional lives when you've um, taken those steps. Um, group, we have about three more minutes of questions um, or dialogue, and then we're going to wrap up the session. So from our participants, Martha and Matt, are there any other follow-up questions you'd both like to make to have Chris or Doug clarify? Um, not at this time, thank you. No, thank you. Okay, Chris and Doug, are there any um, last minute suggestions or just something quick that both our participants can do, maybe even starting tomorrow or next week to um, make a really quick shift in um, the mood in the classroom? Um, I, I would just say uh, sending out an anonymous survey, assuring students it's anonymous, getting their feedback on things. Um, you know, we don't, it's, it's a difficult balance, but we want to make sure that they understand always that we are the captains of the ship that will make, ultimately be making the calls, but that they have a lot of voice in the class. Um, we want to get their opinions, get their views. Uh, but again, at, at the end of the day, we do need to make sure that we have guidelines for our classrooms and impose consequences if there are violations. But that we need to be doing both. So if, if you haven't done this recently, maybe you want to send out a survey with some questions. You know, How's the class going for you? Uh, what are some suggestions you have for making it, you know, a better experience uh, for you personally? Those kinds of things can can be part of the mix. Uh, you know, it's just sort of one thing to do if you haven't done it recently. Uh, I would say at the mid-year point, maybe putting out a new challenge for students, maybe saying, offering some sort of an incentive for them to show that they've tried to use the language outside the classroom somehow in the community. I'm not sure the framework of how you would do that. I would offer my students to, to um, show us just a 30 second clip or a one minute clip of them in the community interacting with someone who uses the language in, a, in as real a setting as possible as sort of a challenge. Or if they're really novice speakers, 
a challenge of finding something out in their world that is in the target language, maybe a road sign or something in a shop, somewhere in their normal daily lives where they've encountered the target language or something from the culture that they can come and bring in to the class and share as a motivator or as an incentive. And you maybe combine that with the idea of setting goals, setting personal goals, that those be their goals, that they go out and find those people in the community to talk to, or that they bring back artifacts, things that uh, reflect the the target culture. Um, you know, I, I just can't tell you what a big uh, plus that's been a big change in the class's attitude and motivation is setting those personal goals. And at first, you may have to give them some suggestions, some ideas for what those look like. Um, in our, as Matt knows, in our mentoring fellowship program, we use SMART goals, and um, and I know teachers use them in their classrooms. But really, you know, what what is a? a it's amazing. Kids don't often know what a good goal looks like, uh, so we have to help them there. But once they start to see that, you know, there's got to be that accountability piece. It's got to be achievable. It's got to be motivating. Um, that that carries over into all of their learning. Um, so. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Doug and Chris, for the very informative conversation. As I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, it has all been recorded. The recording will be made available on request within a few days. Additional details will be sent out to you and to the general fund membership on how it can be accessed. Um, for our attendees um, who have both been here live after this webinar, within the next few days, we will send you proof of your attendance in the form of, of a certificate of completion. In February, please join us for our next webinar on assessment in the World Language Classroom with Laura Sexton of North Carolina. For the remaining web chats of this academic year, just go to flange.org. And I want to thank both Martha and Matt for attending today. Thank you all, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Martha. Thank, thank you, you, Matt. Uh, Matt, you know how to get in touch with me, Martha, if you'd like to contact me at my Flange address. It's dkraus, C-R-O-U-S-E, at flange.org. Um, so, you know, if you'd like to add, add uh, or follow up with any, any questions, uh, feel free. And I'm sure Chris would say the same. I can put Thank you in you. touch with Chris and, and looks like you two are close by. So uh, that, yeah. that, that may work, work out for you professionally as well. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Thanks Thank again. You. Doug, you can end the recording now. I will Thank do. you. Okay. Perfect.